In the first lesson, which provided a review of anatomical principles, we liken the elbow to a basic hinge joint. Now, this is great for conceptualization, but the elbow joint is actually much more complex and requires further explanation if clinical presentations involving the elbow are to be understood. This is the topic of the present podcast. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Gross Anatomy video lecture series. I'm Dr. Stuart Ingalls. In the second session today, we'll be looking at the muscles and the neurovascular supply of the brachium or arm. Before we can get to this, however, we're going to take a few minutes to continue our discussion of the principal bone of the arm, namely the humerus, and also introduce the bones of the antebrachium or forearm, so that we can discuss the principal joint that the muscles of the brachium act upon, namely the elbow. Our objectives for this session will be to continue with our discussion of the humerus by looking at the distal features of this bone, as well as the proximal features of the radius and ulna. We'll then look at how these bones come together to form the elbow joint and consider the biomechanics at movement of this elbow. We'll also look at some clinical conditions related to the elbow. To begin our discussion, we first return to the humerus. This is the continuation of our discussion from the shoulder lesson, when we looked at the proximal portions of the bone as they related to the shoulder joint. Today, we look at the distal portions related to the elbow joint. First note the spiraling impression along the posterior shaft, known as the radial or spiral groove. This marks the location of the radial nerve as it passes in close approximation to the shaft of the humerus, causing this impression during bone ossification between the origins of the medial and lateral head of the triceps muscle. Distally, the humerus terminates in two distinctive surfaces that articulate with the bones of the forearm. The trochlea lies medially. Trochlea is a Latin term for pulley or spool, which accurately describes its appearance. As we will see in a moment, the trochlea articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. Lateral to the trochlea is the capitulum. In this case, the term means little head, which once again is an accurate descriptor for its smooth, rounded appearance. The capitulum makes up the lateral portion of the elbow joint, where it articulates with the head of the radius. On either side of the trochlea and capitulum are the medial and lateral epicondyles, respectively. As we shall see in our discussion of the forearm, these bony protrusions serve as attachment points for the distinct muscle groups. Located on anterior and posterior surfaces of the humerus, just proximal to the trochlea, are two impressions that complement bony processes off the ulna and share their name. The more prominent of the two is the olecranon fossa on the posterior surface, which accommodates the olecranon process during elbow extension. Anteriorly, the coronoid fossa accommodates the coronoid process during elbow flexion. Looking at the articulated elbow joint, we can see how all of these bones fit together. The elbow is classified as a hinge-type synovial joint. Similar to the hinge on a door, movement is permitted in a single direction, in this case flexion and extension. Now, as with any articulation, there is a bit of wobble in what we refer to as joint play that allows minute amount of abduction, adduction, and rotation, but these are considered minimal in comparison to the flexion extension that is observed. The trochlear notch of the ulna is a deep, concave surface that accepts the convex trochlea, but also contains a prominent ridge along the sagittal plane that complements the impression along the midline of the trochlea. Now, this helps to maximize surface area contact and prevent medial lateral shifting between the two bones. Surface area is further increased through contact with the olecranon and coronoid processes, which extend the contact of the ulna posteriorly and anteriorly, respectively. On the lateral side, the superior surface of the radial head contains an impression to accept the convex surface of the capitulum. Note that the elbow joint is made up of two distinct articulations, the humerus with the ulna through the trochlea and the humerus with the radius through the capitulum. Also note that there is a third articulation in this region between the head of the radius and the ulna. Although contained within the same capsule, this articulation, known as the proximal radio-ulnar joint, is by definition not considered part of the true elbow joint and will be discussed separately in the next lesson. The articulating surfaces are entirely encapsulated by a single joint capsule, 
A common feature of most hinge joints is laxity in the anterior and posterior regions of the joint capsule, shown here in brown, to accommodate flexion and extension, as well as the bilateral reinforcement of the joint capsule to help resist abduction and adduction forces. In hinge joints, these are typically referred to as collateral ligaments. On the medial side is the medial or ulnar collateral ligament, which is actually composed of three separate bands. The cord-like anterior and the fan-like posterior bands help to reinforce the joint, while the oblique band serves to deepen the articulating surface. Collectively, these bands serve to resist valgus stresses on the elbow. On the lateral side is the lateral or radial collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament is formed from a single fan-shaped band that merges with the annular ligament that serves to reinforce the proximal radio ulnar joint. The lateral collateral ligament resists varus stresses to the elbow joint. The bony architecture at the elbow dictates the extent of movement that can occur here. Full extension is limited by the locking of the olecranon process into the olecranon fossa, creating a firm bony end field to full extension. Note that the degree of extension varies to a noticeable degree from one person to another. In some individuals, the elbow may not reach full extension before the olecranon contacts the fossa. And this is a common finding in individuals with Turner syndrome, actually. In other individuals, such as the model shown here, the elbow is allowed to extend past 180 degrees before the bony elements approximate, a condition known as cubitus recurvatum. In contrast to extension, elbow flexion is limited by the compression of soft tissues from the arm and forearm and is mostly dictated by the size of the muscular compartments. This results in a soft tissue end feel as the tissues compress and joint capsule distends, typically around 140 degrees. An anterior view gives us an appreciation of what is known as the carrying angle. In extension, the forearm deviates laterally as a result of bony architecture of the joint surfaces. It gets its name for the fact that it accommodates the increased width of the hips to allow greater clearance during arm swing while walking. The carrying angle is typically around 10 degrees in males and over 15 degrees in females. Now this makes inherent sense when considering that, on average, the female pelvis is significantly wider than in the male. Note that the carrying angle disappears when the forearm is moved into a position of elbow flexion to closely align with the shaft of the humerus. Part of the challenge in interpreting radiographic images at the elbow is in differentiating between superimposed structures. For example, we can make a clear distinction between the head of the radius and the lateral edge of the ulna. What becomes somewhat more difficult is the distinction between the rise of the olecranon and the radio density of the trochlea. The elbow joint can be distinguished as a curvy but continuous line with the tip of the coronoid process directed towards the crevice of the trochlea. Next to the shoulder, the elbow is the second most dislocated joint of the body. The most common cause is a fall on an outstretched arm, which results in a combination of compression and hyperextension. This results in an antero-inferior force on the humerus that allows it to slip over the anterior shelf of the conoid process. Dislocations can be simple but are commonly associated with fractures and are thus classified as complex dislocations. The most common fracture site is the tip of the coronoid process as the humerus slips off the shelf of the trochlear notch. Other fractures may involve the olecranon, capitulum, or radial head. The patient typically presents with pain and characteristic deformation at the joint with a distinctive history. Other directions of dislocations are seen but are much less common. That concludes this session on the elbow joint. On the other side of the break, we'll look at the muscular component and the neurovascular supply of the brachium itself. See you then.